go. Alex, you've got thoughts on to spawn discussion, which is the whole point. Let's go. Okay, thanks. Hello, everyone. Hi. 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 Um, I'm Alex. Uh, I work for Linaro now uh, as a Linaro stable kernel maintainer, and uh, I come from Shanghai, China. Uh, this is just a short introduce of myself. Um, actually, I, I bring the idea about the uh, schedule balance. So uh, I want to know how many um, how many guys familiar with uh, this kernel scheduler? Uh, not so much. <laughs> Oh, you mean now or like 15 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't changed much. <laughs> yes. Your MP3 is still skipped. Something's <laughs> <laughs> never changed. So, so uh, anyway, um, I will give some uh, short introduce about this scheduler. So um, and then bring the idea. So you can see the uh, modern computer architecture, and uh, in the central is several CPU and the memory. The outside also I/O controller, and uh, between the CPU is maybe some internal connection, like the QPI as Intel. And uh, um, another architecture is an example of a typical mobile. Uh, it's, it has some of um, like on this picture it has three clusters, and each cluster has several CPU, and uh, um, there are no uh, internal connect connection between the cluster or, or the internal cluster with a different CPU. So the cache sharing is uh, just some connection. So um, if no questions, we can go to the next. Okay. And uh, let me uh, just jump to the uh, current uh, scheduler uh, load balance status. Like uh, uh, currently, there are uh, some of the problems in current uh, kernel scheduler uh, load balance. Um, CFS is uh, the, the man. The scheduler name is uh, named as completely fire scheduler in the Linux kernel, and uh, it has some problems like um, in the load balance. Like the first problem, um, it uses every CPU to do the balance. And the second it uses is a bottom up model and the diffuse for uh, smallest smallest domains. That, that, that's that means every task uh, will get balanced in the uh, smallest domain and then spread out. So it's called small task moving. And uh, um so each of CPU just can pull the task to itself and uh, then do the balance for the smallest internal uh, domain. So uh, maybe a picture can show it better. Like uh, on the on the right, you can see uh, th this kind of three level domain CPU uh, compared to the uh, compared to the hardware structure. You can see uh, on the top level. Like uh, if a new one machine is has a uh, top level domain and then it goes down to the um, a CPU packet is uh, still is uh, is named as core domain and uh, the the third one is a CPU domain and this CPU may have uh, two SMT if it's an Intel architecture so if you ca we can see the uh, task moving during the schedule load balance. We can see um, before the load balance, they, m they may uh, have some task uh, imbalance between the different CPU and uh, for the um, uh, uh, for the for the uh, balance target, we want to um, distribute the different task to move the, the different CPU to average the system load, also the CPU load. So we can see a one hour task move from this CPU to another. That is a, a general schedule balance done. Um, so um, the current balance, um, it will start from the smallest CPU domain, <coughs> like um, 
from this CPU domain, uh, and it will uh, like uh, it will pull the task into the up level. Like if you do the uh, CPU domain, do the CP, do the scheduler balance in the smallest domain, and then it goes up to the second level. So uh, a task here will move to um, another CPU domains and move down here. And uh, if the balance, if, if there are some imbalance between the two core domains, like if there are some imbalance between these two, two domains, the task will bring up to the top level domain and uh, then uh, move, move down from, sorry, join target. <laughs> So move down to the to the another um, call domains. Then see the uh, current um, CFS load balance doing. So um, I have the idea for the for the load balance change is um, current currently every CPU do the task moving, and uh, before uh balanced state is maybe cause uh, several steps uh, task moving. So it's um, cause some catch stone and uh, during the task moving maybe the walk up uh, some idle CPU. Um, if or actually I think um, the new idea is maybe we only need a we only need a central scheduler to do the uh, load balance. The the central like a uh, case thread to judge the whole system balance status. Like um, if there are some some imbalance between the, the different CPU and the different tasks, and there are some moving required from some types to another CPUs, then it may can uh, do the moving uh, directly and rightly. But the current Schedule load balance cannot do it because um, it's just do balance in the smallest domain. It has no idea, um, no uh, recognize our uh, whole system status. So it cannot do for, for the one step. So my, idea, my idea is, is to collect a whole system load information and uh, do the right judgment, then move the task just once. So uh, some changes um, is accordingly required, like um, for the new uh, central balance, like this uh, I, I call top-down model, because you need uh, everything in the whole system and uh, down to the direct right CPU. Like um, now, uh, I don't need to every CPU to do a lot of balance, I just one. Uh, thread is enough, and uh, um, task moving is reduced, and uh, um, task migration time is um, also reduced. So um, the the uh, this this idea is has not become a paint serial. Uh, it's just some idea in my head, but uh, I think it's a uh, worth it. It's a uh, are uh, very really worthy things to try. Um, so this may have some questions, uh, may, may, co may cause some questions for the new idea, load balance, like um, the uh, algorithm from all the CPU redistribution. Uh, actually, you know uh, how tasks and how CPUs and uh, you easily use the information to judge and to do the load balance, but uh, there still has a lot of restrictions. Like uh, if some of those task was pinned to few CPU, and uh, if uh, now the scheduler can collect all the tasks, the type of like uh, some of the task is quick and some task is heavy, or also join some priority um, into the consideration. So this kind of uh, redistribution algorithm it would be considered all the uh, restrictions. It's kind of it's kind of challenging, and the um, the um, another the another is uh, the the power or the performance orientation. Um, 
you know, currently the uh, these these kernels scheduler has uh, is kind of uh, uh, not very good on power consideration. So uh, it's most uh, most on the uh, performance orientated. So it's need to join the new power saving idea into the new load balance. So. Um, I just read the, this idea and want to hear some suggestions or criticize and uh, so uh, anything is welcome. Have you prototyped this by any chance? Uh, still not and uh, I tried to work a uh, prototype out but uh, uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, not finished. It's, uh, the schedule is yeah, yeah, it's very <laughs> complicated. <laughs> Yeah, any idea or any suggestions? The performance balance is interesting and from a cross architecture point of view because sometimes coalescing things on a single core could mean you could run that core faster as opposed to... Right, right, it's different, yeah. So right, it's dependent on the different CPU architecture like uh, some of the architectures in uh, ARM system is hence um, the Pico Big and little architecture, yeah. some mm -hmm. calls go faster, some is slower. It's all those things need to consider. Yeah. But we have something where, you know, on some systems you can clock. Yeah. If you turn other cores off, you can clock that core higher because you can still do better amount of heat dissipation. Yes, so, right. Uh, I guess I, I don't know how we sort of feed that back in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, there are lots of considerations, like uh, if you uh, just con consider for the performance. And uh, like maybe run some machine in the data center. And don't worry about power. So um, maybe just spread all the task average to all the uh, CPUs. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the mobile devices, you maybe run the uh, for the power in sa saving mode. So so it's c it's very complicated. So uh, some of the architecture and so is power getting for the whole cluster. Some of them may be uh, kind of power getting for more device, more smaller CPU. So <laughs> this is different situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, like if um, if uh, 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 ARM CPU is um, power get on the cluster, that means um, even you move all task on just a single CPU in this cluster, the other CPU c still cannot sleep. So it's still waste power. So it may be better to move task average in this cluster. I guess a, a concern also with more central balancing is on a lot of concurrent machines, so you have like 300 hardware threads going, by the time you've made a decision sort of for the whole system, is it now sort of invalid because everything's run for a certain amount of time? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, the, the core idea is the current, current load balance it's just start from the smallest domain. So mm -hmm. before it gets all the system information, it's just can do balance between um, this domain CPU. And uh, the probably when it goes up and find uh, it's do the wrong things, it need to do more better balance during the whole system. Th that's the problem. Yeah, I guess it's interesting to think about the Yeah, anyone <laughs> like to give, give me some suggestion? It's certainly a hard problem because you, you, I mean, you've not just got how many CPUs are there, but what are the, the processes doing that are running? Are they CPU down? Are they IO down? There's so many variables. You can get all the information. You can get it because you are scheduler. You know everything. You should know. And uh, every task, um, our task status or its characters, you you can get everything for all tasks. I guess it depends what the goal is too. Is it to make the most ideal uh, decisions or is it to make one of the least worst decisions? <laughs> <laughs> so we had this. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's an argument when I work on databases where right? you have a SQL optimizer, which means you can run time until the end of time to optimize the best way to run a database query. The problem is that you could have run it the worst way before you've decided what the best way is. And, that's, and if you have an issue exception there, it's yeah. even worse, right? Yeah. And then how fast do you want to make that decision to just get on with it? Live by the heuristic, die by the heuristic. <coughs> yeah. I think it's a, at some point we're now getting just 
a huge amount of variables, right? Because you've now, cores aren't static. Even the number of threads is static. So you, like uh, on power, right, you can change how many threads are in a CPU core at runtime. So, so you have your IQ memory affinity, and there's so many considerations here that yeah. becoming, like having a global idea of what the best shape of the is, I think it's one of the because you know, like magic, I mean, depending on your workload, for example, you might benefit from the shared caches of running two threads on the core, mm -hmm. or you might suffer from it. Yes. But there is no way for the shader to know that, uh, unless you can feed back uh, performance monitoring information on cache behavior, which at this point sounds insane, so it's not far from what regular virtual machines don't even do these days, and they feed back a lot of performance monitoring data from the hardware into the JVM. Um, it be, I mean, the, the shader already today is almost a black box, almost a two-day mode for placement. It's, okay, there is a bunch of inputs, something happens, and then things move, and nobody can really say why and how. Uh, and, and I'm afraid that it works. And it's not the one size you know, what works for your cell phone, uh, where you want to favor probably better life at all cost, except when you're on the core, where, uh, it's not really going to work for your data center or for, you, you know, for, uh, for your HPC application. Yeah, as we talk to the memory and the CPU cache, uh, currently the uh, scheduler didn't consider much other than except the NUMA, the NUMA machine. Only the NUMA and it's currently we all, uh, actually it, 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 this is central uh, schedule balance. It's kind of similar to the NUMA scheduler because NUMA scheduler also has a one kind of thread to consider the uh, memory memory distribution between the tasks and then it uh, will m according to the memory or task bonding to move the task to the different CPU. But it doesn't take into account I/O binding. That has been a problem in some networking applications where effectively you end up having a very strong relationship. So basically, the new actually looks like good in one sure. way, but that's far away from where you need for it, uh, or vice versa. And uh, the, the binding can implies you know, more pieces than that. In fact, when you start talking about things like GPUs, and, and Intel has been doing GPUs in the corporate mm -hmm. as well, uh, it's different, it? um, things get more complex. So you, you, uh, you have at least now four different factors trying to pull. In, uh, and if it goes to the point where you're just doing that manually, right? Like well, I mean, manually, it is quite possible that something like a GC will. Yeah. But, but if you go back to your cell phone or your desktop machine, you want that stuff to sort of just work when you're not tuning it by hand. Yeah. Um. Yeah, right. There are no much consideration in your schedule for the, the, the GPU doing. <laughs> so one, one question is, uh, how repetitive do you work with? As Ben mentioned, a lot of the ABMs already do this, but they do it when they realize they've got a loop, and then they and then they work really hard in that loop. They spend some serious time, uh, assuming that loop's going to keep going. Um, in this case, do you, can you recognize a situation where you're in a repetitive part of your workload where more effort is suitable? So, so what you mean is uh, if there are a lot of uh, GPU loop. Um, so. But um, if you have a situation where you're in a you're in a situation that's persisting, situation persisting. Yeah, in other words, there's a workload pattern that's happening that is resulting in inefficiency. So you want to balance things, right? Right. Yes. Um, if you it, it's kind of a if you think it's going to persist, then you want to do more work to balance it. Versus if it's just changing all the time, then you then you'll have less benefit from doing the extra work. Do you have some, is there some way of recognizing when you're in the state that um, it's worth doing some, some serious work to analyze the situation and possibly move things around to react to it? So uh, I think um, you, your question is uh, depends on the different uh, task pro ta task type. Some task is more uh, consistent running or sometimes it's just uh, running a while and uh, finished. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, currently, there, uh, there are some considerations in the kind of schedule of this. Is, um, it will record the, the task training history and uh, uh, give the different plus the weight of priority. And uh, uh, I uh, actually, in my slides, I start have some intro introduced for this consideration. Let me check. A uh, lot of average, yes. Um, lo it, it will uh, give the different weight uh, from the uh, task history load. Mm -hmm. um, so um, if a uh, task running a uh, long time, it, it will give, um, give a more uh, priority, like this task weight. So that's um, you, another task is just finished quickly, and uh, its uh, task weight is uh, very light. So compare the two different task weight, so then it's, uh, do, do the better judgment. <coughs> so it, so then it can put a, a keep a keep looping task on a separate CPU and uh, maybe um, many small other tasks to another CPU. Well, well certainly if the load is Yes. Uh, shows a large change where that means uh, that means that the it might be working differently, but then you have to go further than that and say, all right, is this current mode of working uh, exactly penalties uh, such that it's worth doing a lot of work to, to rearrange the the uh, processes or the, the threads or the tasks or the Do we give some penalty for the long running tasks? Well, uh, so let's let's suppose you had one pass that one running at all. Suddenly, bang, it's running, it's running full time. Okay, do you need to adjust for that? Well, if it happened to run on a, on a CPU that was idle before, and, and uh, uh, the other the, the other ones are is, if the other ones are, are okay, then no, you don't. On the other hand, if it's now running on the same CPU with another heavy task, then it would be then you would say, all right, we'll want to move these apart, depending on your power constraints. Uh, yeah, yes. Or, you know, to, uh, so it's not just enough that something changed, it has to change in a way that taking some action would make it better, right? Yeah, right, right. There are lo always has lots of arguments on this. Right, uh, so, but that's, that's, the, that's the... It's a hard decision, I guess. That's, 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 the, that's, the, that's the task you're, you're facing, right? Yes, yes. And now, uh, you don't have to solve the general problem, because you, well, uh, but maybe there's special cases. Or maybe you can solve the general problem. Yeah, I think for this kind of situation, it's, um, there are lo always lots of argument and uh, maybe show some um, benchmark data and uh, maybe you have strong voice. Uh, I would expect that uh, benchmarking would be necessary. Right. The problem is I guess my benchmark is somewhat Yeah, well that, that, that's been a, a real problem uh, in a lot of areas. We have these old benchmarks that look backwards and uh, especially in the embedded arena. You only have one CPU, what can you do, right? So now that we have both CPUs, we, the benchmarks haven't caught up yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess another area where maybe we could help would be having an API, which we already have one that I know about, that lets some um, processes get some indication of what they're going to be doing in the future. And then um, saying, oh, I'm about to start being As a recovering user space programmer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just finished the promo and said. Um, the, the problem is then you have yet another API that's specific to something that not everyone's running yet, so your motivation to go and use it is approximately zero, except for one customer somewhere who's complaining, and now you're spending you know, three months of your life trying to tune something that's worked well for one person and will probably not work too well in four years' time when everyone else is running it and the implementation is changed four times. And then you have to use the API right, and then somehow now you're using it right, and you've not just given the wrong information. Uh, you're going to get some users space programs to just say, I want, you're not going to be CPU bound. 
Yeah. And not going to be because I just want to see the other game. Yeah. yeah. And then and then someone's writing a Ruby web app. Yeah. And <laughs> and how do you express uh, all of this? And it's fine, you know, when we're writing you know, system software, but yet yeah, yeah. they're still going to care as much, if not more, because really not, the Ruby app is a is an not to me, not to mention the fact that the instant you introduce an API, you're going to get thirty people buzz testing it. <laughs> and then you're not going to have any time to do any real work because you're going to be dealing with the, it comes out of the fuzz test. You say that life is bad for me. Well, the other thing is, it's like, we're so bad at using APIs anyway. You look at, like, look, my canonical example is like F Sync, where it's just like save stuff to this, and nobody gets it right. Like, and it's so painful. Like, even something as simple as that is so wrong. And yet, you know, when you, now we're talking about too much heuristics back, it kind of has to be. Magic and every tuning parameter is a bug. And as soon as you have a parameter somewhere that tunes something, that's a bug because you decide it's too hard to pass up to someone else. So part of me is kind of like, we're going to give this all to user space, and it's just kind of like, oh, what's well, your problem? Good, good. The, the 50,000 user space processes can all solve this problem instead of solving it sort of once. <laughs> yeah, I think the user curve will solve it. <laughs> okay, if you no more suggestions, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple of things here, a topic that could be sensible benchmarking, um, an attempt not to be an oxymoron, although I think Craig had to run, uh, testing frameworks and testing things, uh, some more security stuff, or <coughs> Q&A, or getting various new people to quiz them and something like that. Yeah, uh, and kernel testing? OK, cool. Who wants to start some ideas on kernel Michael. testing? Michael. Michael. What? <laughs> <laughs> is that the test? What? Okay. I don't know if what is a test pass or test fail. <laughs> yes. Come up and give it. That's e what? <laughs> e what? <laughs> e oh no, I think needs to be somewhere. Just. So this one is my fault. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Nigel Cunningham and I maintain the ugly ducking, duckling among ugly ducklings. The ugly duckling that I maintain is called Tux on Ice, which is an out of kernel, hence ugly duckling, patch for hibernation. Hibernation's been an, an ugly duckling for a long time because it deals with kernel drivers and requires them to save their state and hopefully eventually restore it. Unfortunately, they don't always do that or do it right. And so one of the great problems that people have had since I started working on hibernation back in 2002 is the idea that how do I know, or the question, how do I know which driver it was that caused my hibernation to fail to resume? They introduced this lovely little piece of code, I say in inverted commas, lovely, that stores before it calls each driver suspend or resume method stores a little hash of the driver identifier in the real-time clock non-volatile RAM so if your hibernation yes exactly that's that's the way I feel about it too so if your hibernation fails to fails to resume you can push the power button for four seconds and then when you power your computer back up again, you look in the log afterwards and the D message will give you a funny real-time clock reading of a hash, which you can then use a little program to look up <laughs> what was the driver. Isn't that just ugly? That is the epitome of what testing should not be like. So one thing I would love us to have a discussion about, and I do not have the answer, that's why I wanted us to have the discussion, is how can we improve our testing of the kernel, maybe even having a framework for testing, so that we don't have to have ugly stuff like that and can test things properly before they get into the kernel? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is, that, is that everyone cheering for we should improve the world? <laughs> we, have, we have no ideas. <laughs> Oh, that's he didn't even wait well, for the answer. Well, there's this interesting architecture that's very powerful that we might have. I wonder which one that is. Do you want me to talk about the self-test? Yes. Yes.
Yes. Do this, but then I can't see you. So I'm going to do this. And then you can't see us either. Yep. How's that? Is that right? Oh, I think I'll just hold it on money be a few minutes. Um, <laughs> 10 seconds. So um, should we test the kernel more? Yes. Um, should we test it more before it goes upstream? Yes. Um, there is some effort, well, some effort being made to improve that situation. Um, if you've checked out the kernel since, I'm not quite sure when, but in the three era, um, there's now a tools testing self-test directory, um, sort of next to tools perf and tools, all the other weird tools. Um, and those are written, they're little C programs mainly, some of them are scripts, um, which are meant to self-test the kernel. Um, you know, so there's some syscalls have one, um, the newest syscalls mainly. Um, there's, um, well, yeah, we're getting, we're almost at the stage now where a new syscall goes in and a self-test will come with it, um, which is pretty nice. Um, and so, yeah, if you wanted to help out with that, writing tests for old syscalls would be an awesome thing to do. Um, question? How is this different? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, sorry. So how is this different from LTP? LTP is the Linux test project, um, which has been around for a very long time um, and has never been loved very well. <laughs> um, it's different in that it, it's just a directory. It's not a project. It doesn't have a mission statement. There's no contribution guidelines you can write in any language or, you know, it's kind of lax, whereas LTP is kind of this big thing. There's a directory structure and there's, there's a lot of baggage. Um, well, that's, that's what I mean is... Yeah, I mean, it has tests for specific POSIX behaviors and it tries to be yeah, more like a validation suite for the kernel. Um, and it's just, I don't know, it just never got much traction with actual kernel developers, from what I can tell. Um, the people who write LTP tests don't seem to be kernel developers and vice versa. Um, maybe, maybe that's not entirely true, but that's my impression. Um, the other nice thing about self-tests is, for example, when you add a new syscall, the next commit or the previous commit can add the self-test in the, the git history. Um, so that's pretty nice. Um, and so with a self-test and hopefully a man page for every syscall, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, that's almost like proper software engineering. Um, <laughs> yeah, so in all seriousness, um, if you are interested in working on the kernel at all, um, writing a self-test for a syscall would be a great way to get started. Um, it's not actually kernel code, you're writing user space code, but um, it's pretty low level. You need to, you generally want to avoid using libc, so you'd call the syscall directly, um, and then you'd, you've got to do something to actually validate that the syscall did what you wanted it to. Um, and so, didn't do what you didn't have. Well, and didn't do what you didn't, <laughs> well, but also, <laughs> or not, right? Like, the idea is that the self-tests, anything is better than nothing. Um, and so if you want to add a test that just tests one case in one syscall, like, I would merge that. I think Andrew Morton might merge that. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect to get in. And it doesn't even have to build on all architectures. Um, you know, some people think that's not a feature, but I think it is a feature um, because it means you can get a test in. Maybe it doesn't work on ARM or PowerPC, <coughs> but if it works on Intel, that's... That's something which is better than nothing, so yeah. Um, there's also some self-tests for like memory hot plug, CPU hot plug. Um, sort of parallel is the RCU stuff. There's a whole, that's kind of in there as well, but it's a little bit different. Um, but you should totally work on that as well, because Paul would love that. Yep. Um, and there's also F trace test, which is 
kind of a sub test suite that tests all the F trace mechanism, um, which is what uh, all the function tracing stuff is based on F trace. Um, yeah, so that's that's something that people are doing around testing. So to, to use Nigel's um, sorry, sorry. To use Nigel's example here. Yeah. Doing things like testing the suspender as you go back to the smooth drive. Yep. Is that w when we're kind of crossing the boundary into to requiring high resolution CTS there? Is that yeah, that's hard, right? That it, it, not necessarily. I mean, it is. We, we, <laughs> it, yeah, like it's it, harder, right? It, it is. It's harder than just doing it like a. Yeah. Something that's entirely user space, but yeah. I mean, we want to sort of guide, guide more testing there. And there is yeah, and I mean, uh, maybe twenty percent of the self tests actually cooperate with a kernel module yeah. that does something, um, and so that would probably be the way to test something like that. Is you would have a kernel module that shimmed something for your driver so that you could then poke it from user space and, and do some kind of testing that, well, we have, I mean, you, you know. Can, you can cause individual suspended views, right? You can just do that for the device. Yeah. But then you could get, you could but have but a device you could on and off the drive. Yeah. The other problem is if you have the device and it's your hard drive, you don't want to suspend it. Yeah. So <laughs> there are some issues there. Um, so, yeah, but uh, I think. <laughs> yeah, what, what I'm saying is that Tools are kind of there, and if you have a, a case where your suspender is even failing, then you want to have a look at the self tests. Yeah, well, I think yes, but it is a little harder than, than just writing self tests. But I think there is some momentum in the kernel community to do more of that kind of self test, kind of I don't know, unit test kind of style stuff. Um, Some, yeah. I mean, there's 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 both happening. Um, hmm. The good. I mean, one of the aims of this self test is that they get run all the time by everyone. Um, so some of the like really driver specific testing frameworks have existed in the past, but they tend to be only run by the people writing those drivers. Um, and this, the kernel self-test is hoping to be more like like every Arch maintainer runs it when they do things, and yeah, Paul? One uh, desired behavior that I have by Ellie rather viciously is that your tests are supposed to get done in a like fairly short period of time. Well, ideally, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's another, like, it's a nice thing, but if you have a test that tests something useful and runs for a really long time, that's okay. You can still put it in the tree. Maybe it just doesn't get run by default. You probably shouldn't wire it into the top of the big file. Yeah, that's right. And um, John Stoltz merged a whole bunch of tests for the timing, kernel timing code, and some of those actually, like, break your system by screwing the clock up. And so those are in the tree, but they don't run, like, when you type make test. <laughs> Um, for obvious reasons, because <laughs> um, your system would probably die. Um, but yeah, th st it's still good to have those tests. Um, so yeah, don't think that's a roadblock at all. Yeah. Uh, yep. What do people think about the idea of maybe having some sort of um, lag on device structures saying this one certified to whatever certified means to properly um, implement power management? Yeah. I think. I mean, as a way of saying these ones might cause might be the cause of your system. If they have the pullback, they should be implemented properly. I mean, well, yeah. I don't. You can't. You can't certify anything because the source changes minute by minute, right? Um, and even if you haven't touched that driver, someone might have patched the core. You you just can't. Like it doesn't mean anything, right? Um, yeah, I think in terms of that particular problem, um, you are really stuck. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to think of something more productive to say there. Um, no, I think I mean the thing the things you can do are lots of testing, but that's hard because you need hardware 
and hibernation is particularly kind of horrible to test. Um, the other thing you can do is emulation or simulation or whatever we're calling it. Um, and then, then the third thing is you can have more testing of the suspend regime in isolation. Um, so you kind of try and validate that that part is working for a particular driver outside of the actually doing a hibernation, you know what I mean? Like and, that, and that's probably your best approach. Uh, so there's a couple of, of nasty problems. Oh, clearly, a, a flag to say that this thing does what it's supposed to do is not going to fly. Uh, I just, it know, could fly, it just doesn't help. If, if you have a callback, then you expect it to be better. Mm. Um, mm. Now, the emulation is a problem. Well, emulation may be less than simulation. Simulation is a different method. Put a model of your device and cure me. The problem is what's usually going to cure on such a regime are the weird hard of behavior that you haven't seen yet. Quite possibly, um, yeah. And, yeah. And that's, from my experience, doing a lot of suspended regime work back in the day, uh, this, this is often the way mm. you really hit the uh, problem. Um, what I do think is, is quite worthwhile, especially on, on modern platforms, uh, and that's been very common for on ARM for a while, but it's getting more common all over the place now, where device can be different part of the down of things with CPI interfaces is indeed having a uh, uh, way maybe to trigger the other profile that could be triggered by suspend regime on individual drivers. So boot or kernel with a RAM disk so they don't have a problem of missing that device. Mm -hmm. and run some kind of exercise and bring this thing down and back up and back up. With the system otherwise having activity, that's the important thing. Uh, it needs to be tested in the context of having this request to full where the suspend uh, mm -hmm. comes in. I mean, these are the profiles that are problematic. Yeah. I remember in the early days on, on Fabus, Paul and I did a system reason, but before we even had a system recording, one of the tests I was doing was to play an MP3 of a serial. So I had uh, basically a, a constant flow of data going from my ID drivers and DMA controls into memory, then DMA back into the sound chip, and then the amplifier to have. And suspend and resume the laptop and have a playback resume where it stopped without the and the actions. I never quite got it to that point. So usually, usually it will simply play a bit of buffer and pause while the thing comes with the serial speed back up <laughs> and then continue playing. But uh, this this is a hard mm -hmm. And being able to test that by selectively being able to suspend the resume devices and turn them off. You want to physically turn them off. You want to improve what the hardware does. Mm -hmm. uh, while the system of running the local RAM is somewhere in the yeah. it is a useful thing to do. Yeah. And we have these days much, much better, easier way to do that, and perfect to do that than we used to. We have power control APIs per device, to do that, that, that are generic. We didn't used to have that. So, uh, yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe set a tool or script that make it easier to do the RAM is can exercise those paths. Uh, right? I see that as more pile of automation problem. Uh, I mean, yeah, hibernation is still a little different because you're actually hard powering it off, but that gets you somewhere. It is to some extent, but you can sort of simulate that from the driver context. You can turn on the device and pull the driver out and bring the driver with a fresh state in and then turn yeah. the device back on. The other thing that is similar to that is K-dump. I don't know if you've used that at all. But that's basically the kernel's running and then it panics and it boots a new kernel. And when we first started doing that, we would find a lot of bugs in drivers that weren't used to you know, their device coming up in whatever state it was in. And so those kind of bug fixes might actually help you in suspend or hibernation. Basically having, you know, the driver in at path being really clean about initializing everything in the hardware, not assuming any registers come up in, you know, default state or whatever. Yeah. Same with KXX. Yeah, KXX a little better because it calls the driver shutdown path, but, uh, you know. <laughs> Um, and, and we've never seen any bugs. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it, co it calls it, whether it works. KDump doesn't even call it. It's like, boom, you're in a new kernel now. So, it, it yeah. It calls what it should be called. It calls the thing that semantically doesn't do what you want done for KDump, which is shutting down the device. Uh, what you want is a callback that says, uh, bring, put back the device into an idle state where the driver can pick it back up later <coughs> on, which is exactly what the remove of your module or well, the no. Path, the remove path. <laughs> the remove uh, path usually just goes eh. <laughs> yeah, well, 
point is, anyway. sem semantically encoding shutdown is wrong, and we had a discussion with Benedict about it, never really agrees, never really takes it. Um, I, I have a class from where I thought of fall back from shutdown to remove a full authentication one day. Uh, I mean, yep. we, we use KXEC as a method to go from, to, as a good look. Our good daughter is KXEC. Right? You do, so yeah. Uh, I know. <laughs> and uh, we are still fighting regularly. Uh, you know, we've got the USB kernel in, and XHCI doesn't take it anymore. Right. Some people want USB, it's bizarre. Uh, and uh, yeah, and he just leaves the control to a restate, uh, which hmm. when the DMA table goes away, crash doesn't burn, and the new kernel driver can't pick it up. They can't right. work in a crash state, and the new driver can't pick it up. Yeah, so and I mean, I think that's the same problem you're having is those code paths just don't get exercised much. Yes. And yeah, life's tough, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and like, seriously, <laughs> hey? Life's tough out of the tree, right? Well, it's extra tough out of the tree. I don't even, like, whoa. Well. It's not so bad, actually. I don't use a lot of APIs all over the place, don't change very much, so. Yeah, but I mean, the set of people testing your stuff is, 0.1% of what it could be, yeah. I haven't looked at your stuff for a while, so I don't know why it's out of tree, but we can discuss that another time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, my uh, as a uh, kernel developer, I would uh, encourage you to uh, get as much in tree as you can, because, yeah, then other people are testing those code parts for you, even inadvertently, you know. Well, maybe. If it's not in the tree, they're definitely not testing it. I can guarantee that, yeah. Alrighty, um, any more questions or? Testing thoughts. Testing thoughts. Do it. Do it. Yeah, please. It boots. Ship it. Yep. <laughs> I think it once. Ship it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't need no stinking reproducibility. <laughs> it's the 21st century, dude. <laughs> well, have an update. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Put it in the container and be actually. All right. <laughs> so, uh, what, what? Casey, shush. <laughs> um, so, what, what I wanted to talk about was um, a, a kind of testing you, you, you didn't mention, which is um, uh, uh, pulling kernel code out of the kernel and testing it in user space. Which, you know, we, we kind of talk about it a little bit with, with you know, user mode Linux or, or, or whatever the new hotness is that's basically user mode Linux. Um, but um, if, if, if you actually suck the code out of the kernel, you, you, you can run it through some more interesting corner cases that are perhaps a little bit harder to get to by just uh, doing black box testing on, on the kernel, even a kernel, simulated kernel in user space. Um, so the reason I got to thinking about this is the, uh, I, I recently did some work on the Radix tree code. And I happened to find a test suite that does exactly this, um, apparently originally written by Nick Piggin, although uh, Andrew Morton's been picking it up and maintaining it. Um, but it was out of tree, so I couldn't find it. I mean, I found references to it on mailing lists and looked for it, and, it wasn't, and the, the URLs were no longer valid, and eventually I found it on a completely different website. Um, but I... I I, so, I, so I submitted a patch to put it in tree, but it has uh, very, very few test cases. And my, my hope is that by putting it in tree, it's in uh, tools slash testing, but not under k-self-test, because k-self-tests are a different kind of testing. This, 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 this code actually pulls the, well, what it used to do was have a copy of the code, of, of the of kernel radix tree code. Um, and I modified the harness to actually um, take the code out of, I mean, it's not, it's not quite a sim link, it's a little a tiny little sed script that removes the, uh, the statics and the inlines from, uh, from the kernel source file. Um, and then uh, to build it, it, it mocks up a kernel environment around it. So, you know, the sort of hash define k malloc to malloc kind of usual kind of business. Um, funnily enough, it uses uh, the user space RCU uh, code in order to simulate the uh, the RCU testing, which which I thought was really cute. So you, you've got a user pool, <laughs> people actually using this stuff. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but you know. Um. Oh, cool. Can you use it? No, this, 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 I actually had to go off an app get install liburcu-dev and, and, and then it would build. So, you know, that, that's, I, I think that's actually progress. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it occurs to me that there is probably some, um, if we have some user space programmers here who want to do some cool user space kind of stuff, um, I, I, I think it would actually be a great way to get into kernel development is kind of mocking up kernel interfaces for user space code and, and then pulling bits of the kernel out into user space so you can run them through stress tests and corner case tests and all the other good testy kind of stuff that testing people do. Yeah, I, I bet there's an awful lot of pass common patterns that we have, and there's probably other other projects out there that are doing similar kinds of duplications. So we did the same same work with the net filter simulator, uh, NFSIM, basically faked up a kernel environment that gave you KMALAC and gave you all the standard you know, the, sort of the hooks that net, the net filter code needed. Yeah, net filter code needed. Um, but the, the problem there was, was keeping those user space interfaces in sync with any changes in the kernel. So we did that back in 2005. It kind of got used for a few years there and then, I guess, yeah, just BitRot made it, it the maintenance work of NFSIM more than the testing value from it. So if there was a common set of utilities that, that you were using for your code, that the netful the guys used for their code. Yeah. If upstream run as part of someone's, to say, build bot, that then bug people want to manage. <laughs> no. No, this, is, this is taking small components out of, out of basically copying it out of the tree and running it in, in user space. Uh, and then you can do things like running Valgrind on the kernel code and running uh, you know, allocation tests and, and failures as well. We can, we can that being said, it could very well be that reviving something like the modernity and maybe it could remind the original also way to achieve that in an easier way. You could also, we have the mechanism now that are not quite sort of or streamlined to what is the same devices from the space. You can plug that in as well, which means you could uh, use some similar things to assign the device to a driver running in your space, which is great of debuggability. But then you get into a point where uh, now that value is much more than running into the VM. And, the, and feeding that VM with uh, manufactured information that more crappy than uh, um, but you want some sort of container, you want to just test the block layer, just test method without having to yeah. talk to a PCI device to you generate know, packet. Uh, and it depends, you know, kind of what, what you want to test. What what you want to fake depends on what you want to test. So if, if, if you want to test, uh, let's say, the slab allocator, then what you want to fake is the page allocator, so you can just test the slab parts of it. And you and, and also you want a test suite that's going to call the, the, the slab um, interfaces. But if, 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 you're right, if you're testing almost anything else, then what you want to fake is the slab allocator, and you probably don't even need to think about faking the page allocator because it's kind of boring. <laughs> yes, microkernels are the solution to all problems. <laughs> um, I was going to say, that kind of thing could go in the uh, self-tests. Um, your, the Radix tree. Um, what about doing self-tests? Well, it would just be in self-tests. <laughs> oh, that solves the problem. Oh. <laughs> but I mean, like, it, it when... Doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't really fit, because it's not testing the kernel. The case self-test yeah, is the type not, of kernel that you're running. No, it's not. It's meant... That, that's what it does, but it also does other things, including build little test programs based on the kernel source and test those. So we, on PowerPC, the, all our copy loops, uh, we, we symlink them from the real kernel source, and we build a little user space binary that you know, runs the copy loops in user space and is a test of them. And so it's not of the running kernel, but it's usually of the source of the running kernel. Um, yeah, and I think that's that should be in self test. Um, and I, I think you, you, you should probably tell Schwa that because um, I, I, I asked her and, and she disagrees with your interpretation and since well, she's the maintainer I believe so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can we can discuss it. Um, I mean if it if it takes two hours to run or no, it's like ten minutes. Yeah. And I mean the other thing is it needs to do something with no input. But that's yeah. easy, right? Yeah. yeah, I think that should be in self-test. 
So yeah. Okay. Well, it, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. And as I say, Andrew's taken the patch into his tree now. So you know, go have had a patch it. I, I, I got what I wanted out of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. You can always just self test as apply and make another directory user self test. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. We, we can argue. Much. So like, Skiroot has roughly all of the core code or half of it gets fit in user space tests that you can run under Valorant and attach a debugger to and then do easy GCOP stuff for it and actually use other fancy things that don't lock things up, which is yeah. proved useful. We yeah. don't even symlink, we hash include the C files. Yeah. That works too. Well, yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is, yeah. The problem, like going back to Jeremy's thing about NFSIM and all this stuff, like mocking C code is really hard. And like you're saying, the slab versus the page allocator versus, you know. So I think coming up with a generic kind of mock layer is actually a you can, can of worms. Two end mock layers, one for each side of the lead. Right? Yeah, and mm -hmm. every every different thing will want a different level yeah. of mocks, and mm -hmm. and it changes day to day with the exact headers, like if you pull in slab.h, you need to mock certain things and it, yeah. There might be some commonality, but yeah. I'm not sure we can ever come up with like, include mock kernel.h and just suite it all. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have a lot of dynamic patching stuff in the kernel now, so. You know, we could probably do more using that, I think, um, where you inject failures and there's already some of that stuff, but, uh, you know, it's not, there's not a lot and it's not kind of really tooled up to be really simple, but there's definitely potential there with like, you know, trace points and, and just K probes and, you know, binary patch of kernel, good stuff. Kind has to be written with this to be an yeah, to some extent, but I mean, is like, or is the, sorry? Does that, does that mean modularization it needs to be self-contained, or does that mean they need to be testing hooks? What does it mean to, to write code that is? Well, I think, yeah, I think he means hooks or modules or, but I think that kind of, there's, that's sometimes orthogonal to performance. You know, you want to inline things and make things static for performance. And that hurts testability. So those, you know, that's always tricky. Um, but I think like, yeah, with like K probes, K rep probes, you can make K malloc fail randomly for certain sizes, potentially even from certain code paths. Yeah, you did it. Yeah, I'm yeah. yeah. So I mean, like binary patching, you can do anything, right? You can break your kernel really well, <laughs> but I mean, um, yeah, you can you can inject failures or whatever or latency. You can inject latency in places um, with with K probes, you know. So yeah, I think some of the tools are there, but we haven't quite got to the stage of. And I think that that is a better approach than trying to make the kernel source code more testable, because that will always have a tension with sort of nice nice code and performance code, you know, if you're making heaps of functions global or non-static just so you can test them, that's going to be unpopular. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's basically what my set scripts for us to, yeah. and I mean, I, I could have done it different ways, right? I mean, I could have just done hash define static yeah, and, no. and <laughs> yeah, hash include the .c file, but. Yeah. That's how we get around it. Yeah. Like hash yeah, and, and again, it would be it would be great if we had a common pattern for doing this stuff in the kernel, so I didn't have to make a decision that uh, really I didn't care about. It felt very much like a bike shed kind of decision whether I did it one way or the other. And I just wish we had more examples of this, so I could just use the one that everybody else used and not have to think. Yeah, you're where you may have unintentionally started the standard. Yeah, that that that, that would suck because it's but I basically flipped a coin to decide which way to do it. Well, yeah, but I think right. this is like the whole self testing. This is. Get it in the tree, yeah, and then we can bike shed it. Yeah, absolutely. But if it's out of tree, it's kind of it's nobody cares. It, it's it's a crickets patch yeah, if it's yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's out so of tree. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else? Yeah, 
Uh, it, it, it's, 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 going, it's going to be unpopular to subject everyone to a 10-minute test. As an option. As a, as a mm. But well, I mean, you also can do a .config option. Make, make VM Linux case off test. Yeah. But what are you building them for? The host or the cross target? Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, no, you, you, you're, you're building it for the host because you're going to, well, you're going no, to run it on the host. We never run on that. We always cross build. Really? Yeah. Damn, you, 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 you guys should, you know, make some faster CPUs or something. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, even trust trust me, I, I never cross build for a. <laughs> <laughs> Let me clarify. Even when I'm building on a power box, I'm using a cross compiler because I'm using GCC6 mainline or I'm using GCC4 or you know what I mean? Okay, fair. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I just couldn't resist mocking you, I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, 320 threads. Come on. Make test J1000. Is it a terabyte? Outline has a terabyte? I think it has a terabyte. Isn't that a one machine? Hey? Isn't that a one of the one machines? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. That's just <laughs> one we have lying around. <laughs> I only have one spinning rust disk, though, in a terabyte of memory. I have a 100 gig RAM FS. Who's not this slow, small spinning rust disk? Who cares? 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 in, I don't know, 10 minutes or something. It's, it's not bad, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I mean, we can, we can think about that, but it brings, there's like uh, samples, config samples, which is similar to that, which when you build the kernel, it builds some user space sample code and some kernel sample code. And it's always been a bit of a mess for like cross-building and, you know, yeah. It breaks the build sometimes because it's not clear if it's kernel or user or host CC or whatever. But yeah, I mean, send a patch, well, poke me. But I, I don't know, I'm not sure. I think it's already in the, like, it's in the tree, it's one make away, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like eight more key presses. Oh, it's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I think we should build it, though. I mean, not necessarily run it, but we should yeah, yeah, build it just to check that the, the you know the interfaces haven't changed, yeah. or rather, whoever changed the interfaces gets to notice it, rather than it being some poor sh uh, test maintainer or Maybe. Andrew Morton who has to <laughs> fix yeah. it up afterward. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, if we have more tests that pull kernel code in, that will become more of a concern. Yeah. 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 Cool. Sounds like I got an action item from this. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. What did I anyway? Yeah. Cool. Thanks very much. What was next on the list of things? Um, we have a topic called sensible benchmarking, which we can all decide what that means. Uh, we have more security discussion, or Q&A, or quiz the newbies. I like quiz the newbies. Quiz the newbies, and like, or for either technical or like, hey, are we? getting new blood, or are we all just going to get older and then everything stops? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool. Um, so who in the room is sort of relatively new to kernel and low-level stuff and wants, to <laughs> and wants to come up the front and sort of either talk about it or be asked no, about half it? Of labs, half of us labs, yeah. <laughs> Ah, that could be the other way too. Yeah, but in asking dumb questions, it's just as embarrassing as saying dumb things. <laughs> now, now, if there's nothing we've learned from Eric Cartman, it's just... Remember, there's no such thing as a stupid question unless you've asked it in the group. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? No such thing as stupid question, just stupid just people. Stupid <laughs> <laughs> cool. So some people come on up who's... Newish and really? something. Sensible yeah. Well, yeah. Sounds like a much more sensible <laughs> well, that sounds like a good talk that you should give. I just got to see what what is terrible. I know Cyril just benchmarked a whole bunch of stuff because I've seen his 
benchmarking kernel boot in one of the machines that's actually featured in my talk because I video recorded. <laughs> So that's on and this is on as well. So oh, is just if you want so to just thing catch is like it between your buttons there. What, what, what should we ask new people to the, the kernel dev world apart from what was really easy and what was really hard? It's not the greatest. Um, Are you allowed to say yeah. PCIe spec? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, just keep it in this way. Before I get into that, I just want to... There was an article posted in LWN somewhat recently. I'm pretty sure it's been talked about in other media as well, which is in you know, 2015 basically, how are new developers actually getting into the kernel? And the vast majority of them are through employers, they're through, we both work at IBM, um, Intel, Red Hat, etc. And there are fewer and fewer new developers showing up that are just enthusiasts. And I feel like the barrier to entry, if you're not being hired by one of these companies that's paying you to do kernel development, that's putting you in an environment, that's teaching you, you know, from the basics of like how to send patches and point text email and not leave trailing white space to you know, actually knowing how to deal with these subsystems. The barrier to entry for someone who's just genuinely curious is really huge. Um, outside of direct employment, you know, universities, there's a few unis that still have a kernel dev course in undergrad. If you're lucky, that's probably gonna go away as you know, higher level development becomes more and more prominent in the industry. So you know, people talk about, oh, you know, this would be a great place to get started. How do we communicate that to you know, people in uni or even high school who are curious, who are running Linux, who want to get into the kernel. But well, I don't know. I, I will say, uh, firmware has a much lower barrier to entry. <laughs> <laughs> you should instead all contribute to my firmware uh, project. BMC is even lower. <laughs> is even lower. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we should have some sensible answers. The lawyer is providing that the, the casual hobbyists, I mean, is it just like time and people that they time time money. Yeah. Right. 
running an agency driver or writing simple things like that, uh, you don't necessarily have to be the most experienced uh, car programmer for well, that. And it's a very common chip. Uh, this is a project cool that is covered by the public. It happened that we still the on it and uh, and even sort of bad game, we didn't handle it initially as a sort of certain public project until uh, it became something of it. Uh, there are still, I think, in a lot of hand hardware, especially. Uh, not talking about the chip in the cell phone, of course, because that's going to be obsolete in six months anyway. But the slightly more long lead thing you can find uh, in, the, uh, in the more hobby oriented part of the embedded space. Uh, there, is, there is room for driver. So that's where I might probably be really good with it. And also, some light people have very long lived in that area. So, writing a driver, a new driver for it, that might be, that might be going to exist in a similar form or small evolution in a generation of chips on the line. Uh, it is true that other manufacturers do tend to develop uh, driver themselves, but more of the down the result. But yes, uh, of course, you, you, you can't have a hobby for the next uh, replacement Wi-Fi driver for the next play computer. That's too hard. That requires Well, it also requires access to hardware long before it's publicly available. Yeah, and this and to replace the existing crappy driver with a better. That's right. Well, but, but and then, even, then then to, even to do that, you're probably going to need documentation that if it's available from the vendor, um, it's it's going to be as bad. <laughs> it's going to be as bad or worse than the crappy code. Well, then usually you use the crappy code as a recommendation. You, 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 you use the crappy code as a recommendation of how the hardware works. Uh, and uh, but well, but I mean, I don't, I don't know yeah, if I yeah, into it, but yeah. absolutely here. Uh, and you you're right for a lot of cases, but there are still I think some of them in in full that. One issue. Do I interject with a question? Oh, we no. could, but we long yes, I'm, I'm hearing that. We're saying that there's like uh, there's like the really trivial stuff and then there's really hard stuff and there's the stuff that's in between has kind of been all been done and there's there's no uh, there's, there's no well, I, agree. I mean is that so if we assume okay if we have somebody who's new to the kernel if we say that they have a piece of hardware that they found a problem in what are the what are the other problems besides finding a problem finding a problem to work on what are the other problems uh, how's our documentation building the kernel, uh, finding mentors. Uh, Another issue with even having a problem to solve, obviously device drivers, I'm sure there's heaps of people who got into the kernel because that had a bit of hardware that didn't work on Linux, they wanted to make it work. Nowadays, the vast majority of the devices that people are using are USB, and it's way easier to just do that with like, USB and user space than it is to figure out kernel module stuff. Well, that counts as being a kernel developer, so isn't that a success? Spoke? Yeah, Maybe that's where it becomes employers because then you can pay someone to help yeah. introduce someone and that becomes a lot. And there is some low hanging fruit, like run Sparza to channel, right, channel self test. The thing is, they're all really boring. <laughs> <laughs> and there is no open spark going from there to something more interesting. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's an obvious part yeah. in general. But yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, there is an obvious part in general. Um, there is? There is a third part. There is. No. Cool. But I mean, there's no obvious part, but once you've been in the kernel for a few months, you go, oh, well, I can do this thing and 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 this thing. And this thing, and this thing. But there's no obvious way to get to that point yet, the other than being in full time employment where you're all surrounded by people who say, now do this thing. Uh, so, Starting with the general stuff, uh, I personally doubt as to whether that actually works or not, and we've seen people who just enjoy that, and I think enjoy that for you, and never move from on that. Uh, at some stage, I, well, I think very okay. because he's very actively measuring something. Yeah, and but pushing I mean, he has examples of people who started doing white space and now they don't employ Big, yeah, well, you, uh, well, on one hand, you put them, second hand, what did work in DD? They did work based stuff. They applied for a job at the time of the doctor saying that they didn't work and got the fine time. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but I mean, I think we shouldn't write off people who start to work. Oh, I, I'm not writing off. I'm not saying it's not an open system. It's not necessarily a good way that's going to get you into that. Well, I mean, I think it does get you over all those first hurdles. Yeah. And you send out a manual. And 
except to like electrical engineers. Wait a minute. Who still teaches yeah, C? Yeah, I noticed something funny in the English. You, as far as I can tell, Haskell and Python. And yeah. then uh, a year later, you have assignments in C. Yeah. But they haven't told you in mm -hmm. yeah. So you basically have to figure it out by yourself. So C is the new hatchet course. All right. All right. <laughs> you have to what do you do? You were in the 90s. It was the same. I think most people who are teaching C learn how to program. I think most people who are teaching C learn how to program. brought it up is, which is if you just want if you're a hobbyist mm -hmm. or, a, or an enthusiast as opposed to being employed you might have to spend five years building your reputation as a hobbyist before you get a job doing it full time oh i don't know I, like six months i did five years as a hobbyist yeah okay um, it depends on job you're after. Yeah. Okay. yeah, but now, now I work in security, so your results will may vary. Uh, but well, it's probably h harder to hire the kind of developers now than it used to be. If you had a bigger market of yeah. obviously you could pick from right now. So after you've been working doing security for six months, they offer you a job fixing bugs. Strike that now. <laughs> <laughs> no, they offer you a job running buzz testers. <laughs> <laughs> Is it easier to move sideways, so to grow up? As a developer in something else, and then. Well, that's what I did. No. Yeah. Well, once you understand interrupts, once you understand, I mean, if you, if you can write a Windows device driver, you can write a Linux device driver. It's like, oh God, no. <laughs> 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 no, I think there's sort of a foundation of embedded systems knowledge you can actually pick up that you that is really really helpful. Like, you need to know C. You're probably not going to learn C for the standard you need. AD. You're not going to learn C for the standard. Um, you need embedded systems, preferably through doing it yourself, so you can also pick that up again. Um, and then I think you actually need care. Uh, I think that's where we lose most people. It's hard, and there's lots of other things that you do get fun. Well, one thing I noticed, uh, on, uh, I probably enjoy it. Wait, what are you guys? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Same company yes, in the so same oh, office. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all the same except, except we have one exception. Can we hear from him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I don't consider myself a kind of developer, um, but given everyone else, I feel as I feel, I thought I'd. <laughs> thank you. I'd yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm an embedded developer. Um, I, I am an electrical engineer. Um, oh, that way we should point a microphone, something at you. Feel free to speak into a thing. Um, so I, I, I come from very much an embedded background, um, and as the embedded as as CPUs have become cheaper, um, I, I, I'm, an, I'm a Linux user for 15 years now. Um, but as the CPUs has, have become cheaper, my work has switched more to uh, Linux-based systems. Um, and I was also saying. Um, Early today, five years ago, I went to talks talking about people running embedded systems on Linux, and I thought that was stupid because um, it was just insane. 
that I was working on 8-bit APRs at the time um, and other crappy chips. Um, my interests in kernel development are I'm running ARM systems and there are a few rough edges um, which, which I need to get in there to fix um, to get my stuff running. Um, and the ARM space is moving so quickly um, that the documentation for the Linux kernel is worse uh, in that, that space. Um, things are changing. We're using DTS uh, device trees, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure to buy you a drink or, or punch you in the face. But um, <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, uh, we all put in the right order. <laughs> um, but, but you know, the, the the documentation isn't great, and different ARM projects use device trees in different ways. Um, and, and really, the only way that you can kind of figure it out is to dive into the code. Um, so um, I I haven't pushed a patch yet. I I, I suspect I will be soon. Um, I, I push bug reports, um, but you know, once I'm finished doing this in in a couple of months' time, I, I I don't expect to keep going. You know, I'm I'm stepping in. I have a few very concrete goals, uh, and then I, I plan on moving on. It's not uh, it's not a career for me, um, but you know, um, for the next month or two, I might call myself a company. Uh. Come and use the microphone. I won't get a problem. So I'm not actually associated with any company. I've actually attempted to become a hobbyist kernel developer, mainly because of something broke in my system. I'm like, gee, I really, really wish that that would be fixed. So, but trying to find, either try and find something that's not broken, that's broken and needs fixing, or in my hardware, and or just trying to find, yeah, just trying to find something to work on. So I did actually find something, which was my tablet wouldn't rotate, which really, really pissed me off. <laughs> so I was. By some sheer coincidence, after Googling for about a year, I found someone's driver for the Wii tab or something. And there was like a couple lines missing from my driver, which I pretty much copy pasted, and then suddenly it was working. But that's about as far as I've ever gotten. Cool, so submit it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I posted to the kernel newbies list, and they're like, oh, you probably shouldn't be pushing so many events to user space or something. So um, I never really got further than that. So Send us an email and we'll help Oh, no, they, they were actually really positive, which is kind of nice, but I just was like, oh, they're like, you really should do a bit more investigation. I'm not in this area. Um, I don't think you should push events like that. Like, it was always, a, every, like, tick of whatever the accelerometer was, it would throw an event to user space, like, hey, you do this. So they were like, that's probably not what they want. So I was like, okay, cool, I got into that, and then I got a job somewhere else. <laughs> I got out of uni, so um, that's as far as I've really gotten in device driving sort of moviness. So what, what stopped you from, I mean, no criticism at all, yet. what stopped you from continuing that, that process? Uh, I got a job, uh, so, so I had time, time, time. time, and then also, I guess, um, I didn't really know, go, know where to go next to ask, is this correct? I didn't want to get shot down. Like, so finding a mentor would have helped with that? Yeah, yeah probably. Yeah, it's just like where to ask without asking in the wrong spot. Yeah, yeah. I guess what, you what feel there is a reputation of, of getting a bit off for asking yeah. the wrong question. Yeah. I haven't personally made a bit off, but sure. But there, there's still, there may be a perception of that. Yeah, that yeah. you felt that you couldn't just ask around anyway. Okay, now we'll. Or... So if you had a question, would you ask on IRC? Would you ask on mail address? Would you ask on Stack Exchange? Where Where are the places for these? I probably would just go Googling, and if I couldn't find it, I probably don't know where I would ask. I'd try to, I've looked, there's a, like the mailing list uh, of uh, maintainers, maybe try and find there. I couldn't really find one that fit exactly where I was, because I was like this weird like rotation chip thing, and they were like, there's a little pearl script you can run which says you should talk to this maintainer. I think I may have posted to that, and then didn't get a reply. That's also not uncommon. <laughs> so, and then I kind of, then I was like leaving you to get a job, so yeah. it's been a year. Well, I think like that, it does take to be a great, it's fairly easy to point in the right direction, great problem. Yeah, but how do people know <laughs> that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it well, turns out, email correctly. He just told me. Yeah. If in doubt, email this one particular guy who. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> the colonel <laughs> sitting here. Yeah. 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 That's not what I'd spend my hobby time on. Like, in all honesty, I wouldn't do it unless I was being paid. Uh, can I ask a, a question for the collective? Um, so for... Yes, even. Uh, 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 so, so for example, if, if I had a device uh, like a thermal camera, uh, which was uh, wired in through USB um, and could be operated um, in, in user space, um, is that something, and, and is not is not common, um, is available in, in, in the wider community, but it's not common, it's not, it's not something that a large number of people are going to be using. Um, is that something that you would like to see in the current? Yes. 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 Well, it would depend on the latency standards. Well, so well, in, well, as in the kernel or as versus libusb. Right. So if it really needs low latency and high bandwidth, Uh, this 
these are the kind of things uh, that get in the way of making the string uh, more than how I break it. Okay, right. so worth, worth a shot, worth talking to the video maintainer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think, and it probably speaks louder with patches and here's a driver rather than I have theoretically might do something. Yeah, at the same time, you don't want to dedicate like a month of your life to doing something no one will ever use. I mean, people do that all the time, right? But <laughs> <laughs> if you can avoid it, that's all I do. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that oral, mate? Uh, but no, I mean, I'd, I sometimes I would, wonder. I would, I would certainly want a, a positive indicator from the, the maintainer that, that they would be willing to consider it. You want it for a little bit more than just the learning experience, right? You want to be able to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I mean, yeah, I can do it. I can do it in user space, and it would work. Um, it's just to me, it feels like it probably should be up oh, for. Okay, but lead with code, and I say this because I, <coughs> I'm currently working with like three separate groups at, in three different organizations doing three different things, and they come to me and say, "Hey, we've got this wonderful thing. Would you be in favor of that?" And I say, "Well." I might be, why don't you tell me more about it? Three months later, hey, we're almost done. Wow, I'm really impressed, yes. So could you show me some of the code that, that you're doing here? So I'm, because I've been really curious about that particular aspect of it. Yeah, nothing back. So it's like, so this is somebody who, even though they're doing something I really, really want to have, as a maintainer, I'm not very, very keen on actually taking something from them, even if it turns out to shine shine brightly, because they're not telling me what it is that you know, they're going to come to me with this this big complete solution, and they're going to say, "Here's the here's the solution to all your problems." And it's like I've got lots of problems, and this code isn't going to solve half of them, I'm sure. No, uh, but, but okay, but I, I think it's, it's but not about leaving the code, just keeping the communication going, whether that's code or not code. No, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Any perfect agreement about how things should work. So, yeah. so is, 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 is the video maintainer present? That's what you need to do. You need to talk to video maintainer. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. The video maintainer. If you're going to talk to them without without codes, like I'm, I'm going to build a driver for an infrared camera. Here are seven drivers that I'd like to use. Seven drivers. Which one do you think I should use as the prototype? That would be very, yeah, a, good yeah. a very direct, pointed conversation about technical details, so that the so that the maintainer has an idea of what it is you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And if he gives you a recommendation, you try it, and you end up needing some other one. Then you, he's probably more willing to respond, given you know he's put you on that path, right? No, but yeah. It depends on the maintainer. Yeah. Once, with some maintainers, the best thing to do is just do the best you can with the suggestions and say, okay, well I've got this, but how about if I do it this other way instead? Others, you could say, I'm having some trouble. This one looks easier. What do you think? You know, it just depends on the. Yeah. They're not all unreasonable. <laughs> it's tremendous. It's what? What is asking for him? <laughs> <laughs> some maintainers we want him to answer the questions first. Some maintainers we prefer to ask questions first before you ask them. And yeah. you don't have any way and to know that. And we wonder why people find it difficult to start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. What do you do? It's, it's a, a social hard. process. What, what, yes. What you do? The thing you have going for you is that there are these email archives. So you don't let me go look at what the maintainer, you know, the, probably something similar has happened before. There's more than one video driver in the, in the kernel. Mm -hmm. So what did they want before? How'd that That's go? I don't really want to have to analyze the personality of the maintainer <laughs> before I try it's and okay. Watson can, can do that for you. You just have to read some email. I'll shut that Yeah, so long as yeah. All, all, all you have to do is read the LKML on a daily basis. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 if you're working in. Sorry, I was going to say, uh, in terms of like sending an email and not getting a response, you should just try to remember that maintainers get like a billion emails a day. And the fact that they don't respond to yours may mean that they're like cool, or read it, or they're just really busy. They put it at read somewhere and forgot yeah. some time I mean, and forgot about it. Hundreds of emails a day. It really requires that. Who here maintains a, a project and has an uh, email they've been meaning to respond to for five years or more? <laughs> so, so, so are, are prompts considered for like, if a response hasn't come back in a week, 
Do you? No, a week is not long enough. I mean, if you're posting a whole new driver, I would post it, wait a month. Like, if you get nothing, post it again. Then maybe, like, after two weeks, you can be like, hey, what the hell? You know? But yeah. the other thing, you should also gently. have some understanding of the release cycle. Yeah. If you post it, like, say, four or five comes out, if you post it that day, it'll get ignored, right? Because that's... Tell RC2. <laughs> yeah, so between <laughs> RC2 and RC2, That's a good window. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like, I'm thinking about new stuff for the next window. That also tells me, hopefully, hopefully yeah. <laughs> if so, for example, my, my, my workflow ends up, I end up having, the stuff I do requires a shitload of testing. I mean, I don't, it's not, if you hand me something right, right before the merge window, it's not going into that merge window. In fact, if you hand it to me two weeks before the merge window, it's not going into that merge window. And so the merge window is actually a quiet time. Because not many RC. people are bugging me, they're fighting with their own stuff. And so, but it just depends on the thing here yeah. and other things. Yeah, because hey, yeah. when, when the merge window closes to RC2, a lot of, a lot of maintainers are sitting there kind of like this. I hope I didn't do this. hope I didn't do it again this time. <laughs> uh, but, and, uh, but, but, but the thing is, you can, you can test that fairly easily just by looking at the timestamps on the maintainer's tree, right? If they, if uh, if you if a batch of stuff that went into a merge window has timestamps like immediately before, then that tells you what style they're using. Or if the stuff going into the merge window has timestamps for like a couple of months or two before, then you know. Also, don't just post to the maintainer. Post to the mailing list. Yes. 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 Oh yeah, I think it was the. I believe it was the um, what the list that I thought was correct for that. I just didn't want to be annoying. Because <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. What? <laughs> if you're not annoying, you're not getting anything done. <laughs> Another thing you can try is try reviewing some matches that are on the list already. Those still going to post your stuff to us and get your name known by the maintainer and people on the list. Yeah, that yeah, is right. Right. I'm pretty sure if you're. Yeah. Well, or maybe just ask questions of like. Try yeah. Look at what's going on I think we, we oh. say review and people think, oh, that means I should put a review by tag on something. But what we really mean is you should read it and ask difficult questions. Yeah. 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 No, ask easy questions. questions. <laughs> <laughs> just, okay, ask so, questions. Yes, ask Fine. questions. Ask questions. Yeah. 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 Ask questions for you today. Ask a difficult answer. That <laughs> That's what I aim for. I'm pretty sure if you ask, hey, what does this line do? Or, hey, why are you writing this in the first place? People are more than happy to, yeah. to give you an answer. So, people like to talk about what they've done. Right? <laughs> <laughs> also, they know that it if they don't the quality, answer the they're questions, they're it will never go in. Yeah. <laughs> if it's a cricket patch. Yeah. Why are we doing this? Tell me why we're doing this. Like, that's half of it. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> if you keep asking, why, why is this code here? What is it doing and why? You might become a maintainer. <laughs> 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 More quickly than you'd expect. <laughs> the commit that's very software. concerning. <laughs> The other thing you have to be careful of, um, I, was, I went through several years with a bike in a repatch in. And about 2005, I posted an RFC and bam, I went in. I'm, yeah, okay. uh, it was something involving signal code, and I was kind of nervous about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a really good reason. <laughs> uh, uh, and the thing is, you don't know what they're testing or what they're doing with it. You know, it, it's, and I should have just said, hey, I haven't, you know, you really should think twice about pulling it in, but that wasn't, you know, I couldn't bring myself to do that, right? That would have been the right thing to do, but no. Anyway, uh, a few months later, Lena says, you know, this thing's crashing my machine. Uh, we, what were, you were trying this or this. I'm going, well, it wasn't anywhere near that sophisticated. I want you to revert it. He goes, well, yeah, but when it runs, it's three times faster. <laughs> <laughs> I was going, uh, I gotta figure this out, but before I even really got to look at the code, a guy named Oleg Nesterov in, uh, I think it was Red Hat he's in Russia, he goes, well, yeah, but if we have this patch, what happens if this happens over there and this other thing happens back there and this thing happens over there? I'm going, oh, thank you. And Oleg, and he goes, well, well this patch, fix it. <laughs> so, but so, what's, what's that? Oleg Nesterov? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oleg Nesterov? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, we should talk about the bus factor for the next girl, because <laughs> it scares me. <laughs> well, if you want to be scared, talk about the bus factor, yeah. Yeah, it's like, I'm, I'm told Alviro is like the only person who understands locking in files. Yeah, we only had one other reason. Where does it do? 
Okay, so there are two people who understand locking in files, and one of them's too busy maintaining the entire project. And that's two people more yeah, than understand it in user space, so. Neil, Honestly, I, I think it's about a dozen people who understand the, the locking of the BFS well enough. Uh, Dave Chinner, Crystal Pelvey. Um, I could probably pick it up in about a month if I really had to. Um, it, it's not, I, 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 I understand it well enough. Yeah, and don't, don't worry about those guys at all. I have been flamed by all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't all have to understand it. No, no, I'm not concerned. I, I don't particularly feel the need to understand it. It doesn't relate to anything that I particularly so want you to. So you think. <laughs> At this point, yes. yes. What I'm worried about is that someone will get hit by a bus and then we'll go, hmm. So you should study it. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's um, things but I don't want to be an expert in that. <laughs> At some point, suddenly, you think that this is a piece of black magic no one can understand anymore and somebody comes out of the woodwork and, oh, now I can fix it this way, that way, that way. And we have people appearing like that wriggle, I mean, not a lot, but not wriggle ever. Uh, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Uh, it might impact a given subsystem or something for a while, but eventually, especially if there is a need, uh, no, that's a code, if there's a history of the code, if there are all the chances are there, the, 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 if, if somebody really wants to dive into it, there is material to understand. Let me, let me give you an example of that. So I was, uh, uh, a lot of the formal verification people are back kind of in the 80s. And <laughs> so uh, cool. you need to use a special language and you need to not use anything that will actually scale because they can't verify it and on and on and on. Yeah. Anyway, there's a few people that are in, the, in that field that really want to you know, pull things ahead to 2016. And uh, occasionally, and of course they're seen as the rest of the field thought as dangerous radicals. So occasionally they'll invite me to one of their workshops to film a real thing for try to pull this like. Anyway, I met, I met this uh, so I met this thing. I'm supposed to present 20 minutes in RCU to a bunch of grad students in, in Rome the next day. And uh, I'm listening to this lightning talk series. Now in this field, lightning talks take 30 minutes each, just so you know. <laughs> and they're talking about stuff I, I mean, I may have heard of it once or twice, but what is this stuff, right? Some method that somebody came up with and modified by me. And, and I'm, I'm losing it. I'm pretty badly jet lagged. Finally, the, the last guy to speak gets my attention um, when he talks about taking two formal verification techniques that I've ever heard of, but combining them and producing a tool, and you stop the code in the tool, and it tells you whether or not the code, the parallel code, gives you the same result on a weakly and a strongly ordered machine. Okay, which yeah, that could be useful, right? Especially anyway, for those of us who work for companies that produce weekly ordered machines. Yeah, that too. <laughs> uh, and uh, so that's 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 interesting. But I you know, and then he gets really gets my attention when he tells me what code he's using to test his tool. I heard the story. Probably, yeah, the uh, it's the uh, he was using the RC implementation Linux kernel. So of course I put my hand up and asked him had he found any bugs. And he took that as his cue to explain RC usage. <laughs> <laughs> the key point is he understood it well enough to know what functions did what. And I had no idea this was happening. I doubt if the guy would ever jump into the RCU maintainer. He's a you know, tenured prof at Oxford. But, you know, there are people that look at this stuff and understand it without necessarily letting the world know about it. In fact, the, the talk, when people like us uh, talk about the bus factor, I think to some extent it's a bit hard to think that we are so good at nobody else can understand. Uh, no, I think they can. Yeah. I just don't We're think that, they, that we've culturally put in the effort to say, do we have a, a small team rather than an individual? Well, we, we, we just have to be from somebody who can step down as the MD maintainer. And he was just like, all right, I'm done at the end of the month. And we had five or six people who have formed a team, I believe, yeah. who are going to do that. So it's just kind of. People will step up, people will form a team when people get tired of doing stuff. So yeah, I think, I think we're actually we're okay. You should probably mention, so we did talk about a specific subject at Carl Summit uh, yeah. last year. And uh, Linus uh, did uh, express his appreciation for the that new thing that's been going on for a little while in some areas, which is maintenance groups. Yeah. So uh, I can start putting some architectures such as uh, FHC and ARM. Yeah. Um, and ha having multiple people effectively be mentioned would not even the hierarchy between them. And, uh, yes. and, and that works really, really well. Um, in 
fact, Linus himself then mentioned that he would be open in uh, operating the top level as a metal group at some point as well, provided he found the right people. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it may well be the, the, way, the way to go. So, uh, it's got nothing to do with newbies though, if you don't worry, I'm talking. Yeah. The, the downside is that we're running out of time before they lock the doors and we have to talk all night. <laughs> I think they're not. Uh, but, but there is the opportunity to continue discussions at uh, a pub or some other venue, or the Linux Australia AGM, which I'm returning officer for, so I have to get over there at some point. Um, hopefully today was productive and thought-provoking and uh, somehow beneficial to everyone, but thank you for coming and discussing. And yeah.